And、uh, I went to Bemidji, Bemidji State, you know, for a track meet. That is not too far from here. So that's the furthest up、uh, Minnesota, beside Alexandria, heard of Alexandria, right? So I was there too. So I'm glad able to come up north, and I'm so happy to、uh, see Pastor Chris and his, you know, ministry brought him here. And、um, I just want to share something. You know, I am not a very special person, but we have a special God. Okay, and I do not want you to feel that you know、um, missionaries are very special people. No, all of you are special because God made us special. Okay, you are missionary too, in this area. Okay, and we are all having a special calling in life. And my calling is in a different place. Your calling is in this place. And all of us are equal in the eyes of God. Am I right? There's no such thing that、uh, it's a special、uh, ministry. All of us are special in, in your own place. To be honest, you know, because two weeks ago I met some group of、uh, Christians from India, okay, and I told him that hey, I'm doing ministry work here, and what do you do? He said I'm an IT computer guy, engineering. But he told me that hey, your job is better than mine. I said no, no, no such thing, you know, that you are called to reach out to the people in the marketplace. And I'm called to reach out to people in a different place. Am I right? So I just want to share this thing so that all of us realize that we have a place in God's、uh, ministry. Am I right? So that's the thing that I would like to start off. Okay. I also wanted to、uh, give some gift to the the kids that sit on the table there. I only have you know just enough for、uh, kids、uh, gift. I think for five or six kids. Okay. You sit on the same table. Am I right? Yeah. All right. Just before I、uh, came back to、uh, Malaysia, I met a Muslim guy、uh, just the last week before I came back、um, two years ago. I got a permanent resident、uh, green card, so I'm not afraid of Donald Trump anymore. Yeah, <laughs> I know, man. He's otherwise, you know. So when I see, you know, okay, <laughs> I've been in this country quite long, so I understand some jokes here. So. This Muslim friend, he is a very famous、uh, batik artist. Maybe our friend、uh, Tony, your daughter, will explain to you. This is batik. Batik is very、uh, popular in Malaysia,、uh, Indonesia, and Thailand. It's basically some sort of a drawing dye. You know, they draw it on the clothes, but it's not a special kind of watercolor. It is a very special kind of color, and、uh, they draw and they make patterns and design, and they can draw on cotton. They can draw it on.、Uh, um, do I bring the sample? I mean, this is just my icebreaker. Okay, I, I want to tell story beside Bible story, so that all of us will feel that you know, mission can be fun at the same time challenging too. All right. So the end product of batik can be something like this. Okay.、Uh, this is not my pajama. Don't misunderstand me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I mean, you know, I understand that things are happening in this country with this kind of, you know,、um, <coughs> okay. So this is batik. This is called batik, you know. So I met the guy who draw all this thing, and he is one of the celebrity batik artists in Malaysia. Wow! So he's a Muslim friend, and、uh, God gave me a, a heart for Muslim. You know how I got that burden? It was when I came to this country. So when I was in Malaysia, growing up all my life, a lot of us minority, we are minority Chinese. My grandparents migrated from China to Malaysia just before World War II. All right. So Mal-、um, the Chinese is a very、uh, small minority group, and then we have the Hindus from India who moved over to Malaysia in the early 1900. A lot of them came because the British, you know, brought them to Malaysia to work in the plantation, and then the Chinese work in the mining, you know, industry. And the Malays, the predominant group, Malays, they are from Southeast Asia islands. Some are from Indonesia, Sumatra, Jawa, Sulawesi. So those people group came to Malaysia, but before they came,、uh, the original people there are the native, just like the Native American here. They have the native in Malaysia. So the native in Malaysia are still there, and many of them are still living in the reservation,、uh, just like the you know Native American here. So the Malays are a mix of、uh, people from. Uh, the islands, and many of the Malays are Muslim. But before Malaysia became a Muslim nation, 
Malay was uh, very much a Hindu or animistic. Uh, animistic means uh, they believe in spirit of you know in different places spirit. So when the first uh, sultan or the king, we have kings over there right now, kings and queens over there. <coughs> so when the first king became uh, Muslim, so a lot of the followers, the, the, the people in the village follow the king, you know, I mean, it's just a part of the story, you know, I mean, you always hear that when the king becomes something, you know, a lot of people follow. So that was uh, probably in the 1500. So Malaysia uh, was colonized a uh, few years by the Portuguese in the 1500, just a few years. And then the Dutch, you know, from Holland came in the 1600, and then the British came in the 1800. And then Malaysia, thank you, sir. Malaysia gained independence from the British uh, in 1957. So we, we are still a very new uh, country. So right now, Malaysia is uh, in the crossroad of trying to redefine its identity. How to be a nation without much Western influence, but at the same time, the Western influence is very strong in education, in entertainment, in fashion, in sports, you name it, in religion as well. So a lot of missionary work in Malaysia started by Catholic missionary from Europe. And uh, later on, we have uh, the British missionary came, the Anglican Church. Have you heard of the Anglican Church? And then we have the Presbyterian Church. And then uh, after that, the Assembly of God Church came. And then the Baptist, American Baptist Church came. So I, I, I'm very honored that i spoken at this uh, old churches that started by American Baptist missionary. And uh, guess what? Last week, I met the daughter of a, pining past, a pioneer pastor of the first Assembly of God Church in Malaysia. Okay, she is probably about 80 years old. Her father, if you check church history, Arthur and Esther Sandoff, S-A-N-D-H-A-L, Sandoff, okay? His parents, her parents, planted the church in the 1930s in Malaysia. Okay, I visited a friend in California as part of the ministry and the work. I will share with you later why I got there. And then my Malaysian friend, he is one of the associate pastors there in, uh, in this, uh, you know, uh, church just outside of Los Angeles. So my friend probably told her about me coming. And then this uh, elderly lady, 80 years old, came and approached me and greeted me in Chinese. I was like, what? <laughs> okay, somebody greeted me in Chinese. I, was like, I got shocked. And then she told me she was born in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And she, she lived there almost like 10 years. And she still remember. Um, you know, the language, the, the local dialect. And she told me that her parents planted the first Assembly of God church in Malaysia. Wow. And I met her. You know, what is so amazing is 1930s. How many years ago was that? 100 years, maybe? 85? You know, America sent missionary there. And here am I. I feel humble that my church in Malaysia sent me back. You know, and they deported me back <laughs> to, to Minnesota. You know, there's an exchange. And this summer, when I go back for three weeks for some reports, you know, to the church, I'm going to, re I'm going to go to that church. I said, hey, I visited the daughter of the man who planted your church. I mean, I just can see myself having tears, you know, saying that. Just want to encourage them to finish the race strong. Okay? Yeah, that is... The highlight, you know, of the week for me to meet, to meet this lady, an 80-year-old lady. Her name is Eva, Eva Kramer. And she told me that her Chinese name is Iwa, you know. But wow, my goodness, she pronounced very perfect Cantonese, you know, Chinese. So, okay, Bate. Okay, so I met this Muslim friend just the last week before I came back two years ago. I didn't know that he was such a celebrity until he told me who he, who he and what he did, you know. And uh, he said that he would do exhibition of Batik in Paris, in Dubai. Wow, such a humble man. So we just become friends and um, we keep in touch on Facebook and uh, on WhatsApp, you know, the WhatsApp app, you know, on phone. So I keep in touch with him and he knows I'm a Christian, you know, and I visited him and um, 
So God has given me, you know, the burden uh, to connect with Muslims when I am here in this country. When I was in Malaysia, a lot of minorities feel that, oh, we are being oppressed, you know, by those, you know, uh, Muslims, you know, so we don't really like to talk to them. So when I came over to this country as a college student, I began to see a lot of Americans' uh, ministry. Um, I'm not saying here, maybe, you know, when I go to mission conventions, you know, they, they have a heart to reach out to Muslims. And then I began to, to open up and begin to understand that, okay, I need to really change and uh, confess that, hey, you know, uh, they need the Lord Jesus too. You know, just because some of them are bad, very bad, it doesn't mean that everybody is there. That's why we need to tell them and share the love of Jesus to them. So I begin to have a, a, a more compassionate heart towards Muslim when I'm here. You know, so when you go to a different country or different place, God can change your heart, how you look at Minnesota, you know, how you look at people. Because in Minnesota, things have changed over the last 20 years. I mean, if you drive up to the Twin City, I mean, it's almost 150 nations are there. You know, you do not need to go to Somalia. We have probably the largest uh, Somali uh, population outside of Somalia in the Twin City. And then we have the largest uh, Hmong population next to California in the Twin City. And then we have a lot of uh, Russians. We have a lot of Eritrean and Ethiopia. And, uh, you know, a lot of... Uh, Chinese, you know, from China. At the University of Minnesota, we have uh, easily a couple of thousand Chinese just from China. And if you have Chinese from Malaysia like me, and if you have Chinese from Taiwan, Chinese from Singapore, uh, Chinese from the Philippines, I mean, you know, I mean, God has brought all these people here. So that is the reason uh, why missions today is so different. It's so different. And one of the things that I want to start with this uh, evening is I want to tell the children that you know, I'm so blessed to see all of you here. You know, probably a lot of kids you know, um, in many churches, you know, they have kids program and now some of you are here. Okay, this is called Bate Kid. So you, this is uh, given to me by... Oh, sorry. I lost my anointing. <laughs> okay, so this is a Bate Kid. When you draw... You know, it's going to turn out something like this, and you can frame it up, okay? Your group is probably the first group in this area to have it. I think i give it to your son too, okay? You can take it out. The brush is here, inside here. The, the, the palette where you mix the water is here, and the, the different colors are here, and you can mix the color, and you can turn out to this color. So, uh, okay, why don't the kids come out? Come on, okay? All right. Yeah, okay, one... Two, okay. Sorry, man, you're not kids. I cannot give it to you, man. Three, four, five. I'm going to give you the extra one because the extra one is uh, just the, uh, where is it? I think it's, uh, okay. I hope I'm not interrupting too much, okay. So I think the color would be enough for you to draw another one, okay. So you can just, uh, you know, there are two there. And then you can uh, just share among yourselves uh, today. And uh, I know some of you are saying, I wish I was a kid too, you know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you can just share too. And then, you know. Yeah. So you can, you can draw two or three with that. Okay. Next time I'll bring more for the bigger kids. I mean, you know. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So when you're done, you know, you can frame it up and uh, tell yourself that, hey, you have friends uh, from Malaysia, okay? So remember, kids, pray for my Muslim friends. His name is Rosli, R-O-S-L-I, Rosli. I'm going to take a picture later to show to Rosli that, you know, I promote his art here in the U.S. He'll be so blessed. So when I go back to Malaysia this June, I have more reason to share the gospel with Rosli, Am I right? Yeah, I'm trying to bring Rosalie to Minnesota maybe next year so that he can promote his art here. At the same time, he will experience the love of Jesus here. Because in Malaysia, it is pretty much, you know, uh, a crime to share the gospel directly to a Muslim. So even if my message tonight go out to Malaysia, I'll be in trouble. I'm serious. So uh, hopefully uh, it won't uh, reach that far to Malaysia. I'm serious. Yeah, this is not a joke, okay? 
because Malaysia is uh, uh, very much uh, careful about other religion not sharing their faith to Muslim. But Muslim is allowed to share their faith to other religion. It is a fact. I live there all my life. I'm not lying. I'm not making, you know, Tony will probably uh, share with you her daughter's experience over there. And uh, Malaysia is a country that pretty much uh, uh, feel that the Christians and the Jews are trying to, you know, dominate the world. So that is their view about, you know, things. So yeah, I just want to share a few things that would uh, inspire all of us. Okay? Where do we begin when we talk about missions from a Malaysian perspective? It's very important. WWJDD. Okay, many of you here, what is that? Do I add an extra thing there? Some of you heard WWJD. What does it mean, WWJD? What do you think WWJDD means? Just give a guess. It can be so many words you can use to replace the... the, the. What, what? You got it right. Man, I'm serious. You got it right. What would Jesus' disciple do? I'm serious. I, I thought some people would say what would uh, Jesus and you know, other, you know. I'm just impressed. So praise God. So tonight we're going to talk about discipleship and mission. Because disciples look at missions differently than just ordinary Christians look at mission. Okay, when I first came to this country, I came as a Christian. But when I was involved with mission work and uh, someone discipled me, I began to understand more about discipleship and then I began to look at life differently. As I grew up in my country, uh, we see different religions in Malaysia. We have Buddhists, we have Hindu, we have uh, uh, Confucianism, we have Islam, different Catholics. Okay? So I pretty much uh, began to be so curious why are there so many religions? Are they the same? Um, I know that they have a lot of good stuff you know, to teach. I began to uh, learn more about other religions. In fact, I do have Muslim relatives in Malaysia. My father's uh, sister, my aunt from my father's side, uh, the eldest one, married a, a Muslim man, um, probably in the 50s, okay? And uh, she got converted, and I do have Muslim cousins. So some of the pictures, I will show it to you. So I began to... Uh, find out what is it about other religion? Is it compatible? Is it all religion lead, uh, leads to the same uh, path? I, I do have that kind of question too. Okay, just like some of you here maybe. So I began to study more about Jesus. I realized that Jesus is so different. Even though in my, if I'm not a Christian, I still ag uh, acknowledge that he is extraordinarily different. No one had ever done so many miracles like him. Okay? And all the religious guru come, live, and die, and Jesus' body wasn't there today. Okay? So that is some fact that began to make me think deeper about Christianity. And um, the best thing to realize that we need to find out more about Jesus is why did he come and what it has the impact on us, you know, in our life today as disciples of Jesus, okay? I hope I'm speaking a, a good English here because when I come here, I have to learn how to speak a different English. Yeah, how to speak Minnesota. Yeah, okay? Oh, yeah, all day, yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You turn on now. Uh, I think it's on. I think so. Yeah. So yeah, I think um, I do not want to uh, uh, take too much of time. But these are the verses I will give all the slides to your church because this is my lifelong message. Other than discipleship, okay. Where do we start when we talk about missions? Because sometimes we have a guilt trip, you know, when. Uh, it's a mission week again. We've got to raise 200,000. We've got to go to Africa. We've got to send money to you know, India. We've got to send money to Afghanistan. You know? I mean, this thing happened in churches. Year in, year out, year in, year out. Am I right? So I have the same kind of uh, dilemma like you too. Can we revisit the main purpose of mission instead of just sending money? You know? To be honest with you, 
I want to be a self-sufficient missionary in this country. Okay? I'm not here to ask churches for money. That's not my main reason, even though I'm still raising support. I know that I could work. I wouldn't get deported by Donald Trump anymore. I got a green card. Okay? But the most important thing that we need to understand is Jesus has a mission when he came to earth. And Jesus is coming back. Amen. We need to keep that in mind. It's not because there are poor people around the world. There are poor people everywhere. There are a lot of homeless people in Los Angeles. There are a lot of poor people in the Twin City, which I never thought, wow. I mean, this is America. I mean, before I came, I thought it's supposed to be a, a, a rich, rich country. Am I right? And there are poor people everywhere. So what should drive us for missions? It is because God really loves the world and He's coming back. And He's coming back. If Jesus would never come back, there's no need for us to do mission. We just try to be good citizen of America, you know, good citizen of the world. Because Jesus is coming back, that's one thing. And there's no extravagant love from any religion guru like Jesus. He suffered and he died. He understands your pain and my pain. And that is something that other religion has not come close. I acknowledge there are other good stuff that other religions are teaching. Yes, we need to acknowledge that so that we can build common ground. But there's no other religious guru as unique and special like Jesus who came and walked. You don't have to be a Christian to, 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 to learn about this. It's in the history book of non-Christian uh, sources in Malaysia. When I was a kid in uh, a Muslim uh, public school, we learned about Jesus, how unique he is. We learned about that. But the Muslims say Jesus is not the Son of God. But it has half of the truth there. So, because Jesus you know, came and died for us, and he promised us eternal life, and he died for our sins, and he rose again as the only one, his compassion, that itself is the driven factor for mission. It's not because there are poor people everywhere. You know, that should not be the reason. I know that that is an important reason. Okay, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you don't have to refer to it wrong. Jesus asked his disciples to stay put. Don't go yet. Stay put. Right? Sometimes when we think about mission, we have to go, go, go. Am I right? But here, before the mission happened, Jesus said, stay put. Wait. Wait for the counselor, the Holy Spirit to come. You know, whether you're a Baptist church or an Assembly of God church, you know, a charismatic church, we believe that the Holy Spirit is still the same today, yesterday. Amen? The Holy Spirit will come and guide us. I'm not talking about you know, doctrine of uh, speaking in tongues. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, period. Because in Malaysia, even if I'm not a charismatic or even if I'm not a Pentecostal, we see the manifestation of the evil spirit. People are possessed by demons. And you need to cry out, God, Jesus, help me. And then you sense that the Holy Spirit is really coming to you. You don't have to be uh, you know, uh, charismatic to understand that. If you are a Baptist, if you love Jesus, you know that you need the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when I talk to other denominations, I ask them, if you believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, then we can link arm and work together. If you believe in the Father, the Son, and uh, Randy Moss, then it's different, you know? <laughs> or, or, or Chuck, you know? Uh, Chuck Norris, it's different, you know? So even though I like Chuck Norris, I think he's a Christian, right? So, so these are the three factors, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that should link arm among all denominations. Am I right? Those are the minor things. Let it put aside. We can now, you know, agree with everything. Am I right, Pastor? You know, Chris? Let's agree that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, yes, we're working together for that. So Jesus asked him to wait, wait for him, be in power, be grounded in the word. Matthew 28, 16 to 20, many of you are familiar that Jesus, you know, last command, you know, go, all authority be given to me. Make disciples, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to obey all things. So it's a process. It's not just you know, telling them the truth, but teaching them by example. So that is why discipleship is different than just Christianity. Christianity is the first introduction, 101. Discipleship is a process. So when we understand that WWJDD, then we will begin to live our Christian life much intimate and see ourselves as a lifelong disciple of Jesus. All of you and I, we are sons and daughters of the Father. But the process of maturing is called discipleship. The process of maturing in Christ is called discipleship. John 15, talk about, you know, Jesus said, remain in me. Right? The wine and the wine dresser, remain in him. That means continue. It's a present tense. Coming from a non-native English speaker, I understand, okay, remain is always a present tense, no ED, right? So remain is a, const- it's a constant present tense. How do we remain in him? The word. We need the word. Just like many of us eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You can skip lunch once in a while, okay? If you uh, skip your meal for two days, it is not going to be very good. Same thing, we've got to remain in Him. We've got to eat that food. We've got to eat that food. The word, the spirit, we pray. As we connect with other believers, we link arms together. All the branches are together now, linking you know, to Jesus. Before we go, we've got to link. We've got to connect. That is it's a lifelong thing. So I think, you know, I've been enough to many different churches. I'm not bragging. Okay, I, I, I visited, I spoke at Baptist Church, Southern Baptist uh, Assembly of God, um, Lutheran Church, uh, non-denomination, charismatic, uh, different church. Sometimes, churches overemphasize going, but not linking, not remaining first. We must go to the gym to exercise the muscles before we go out to fight with the giant. We cannot send soldiers to go out without equipments that they, that they need. They have the equipment. But sometimes we never use it. Just going to the gym and look at the machine will not make your muscle puff up. <laughs> we need to remain in Jesus, His Word, His Spirit, and not fellowship with one another. We need that all the time. We do not want to let technology replace our fellowship. Jesus has given us the DNA, the organic fellowship in Acts chapter 2, verse 37 to 42. To, to, to meet together, to break bread, to listen to the elders' teaching, the, the pastors' teaching, to uh, share food together. That's why we're having curry chicken tonight. We're sharing food. You know, if you're sharing more food, I think this place is going to be overfilled. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. And having food... Oh, man. I heard a voice. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Thank you. No, that's okay. It's just that we need to, we need to uh, make it so it won't do that. I'm being rebuked now. No, you're not. I'm, I'm just going to make sure it stays put. Are you okay? Am I speaking Minnesota English? Yeah. Okay. So we need to encourage one another to remain in Him before we go. That is a very, very powerful thing. We cannot replace technology you know, with a uh, real human touch. I'm not saying that we cannot uh, use iPad for our Bible. I cannot say that we cannot use uh, uh, television you know, to, to uh, listen to a sermon. I'm not saying that. But there is something unique about Jesus' ministry that He become man. That He suffer with humanity. That He cry at a funeral. He laugh. He feel, you know, upset when people, you know, make the house of God, you know, into a, a merchandise place. The emotion and the, 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 the feelings, the heartbeat of God 
was felt by the community. We cannot replace that with technology. Even though you put a lot of smiley face you know, on the iPhone and angry face, you know, people don't feel that. I know that. So we need to get back to the basic of missions. Mission is the feeling of God's heart when the community see you. It's not giving food. That is one of the elements. It's not just giving money, even though that is another you know, important element. It's the emotion of God in you, in the community. It's very important for us to get it right so that we do not just send money to Africa, send money to Waihan. You know, that's not the main thing. I want to feel the pain together with you when I minister to the Muslim. I want you to rejoice with me when a Muslim friend came to the Lord. I just don't want you to hear, oh, why haven't you got a bonus because you reach out to the Muslim? I'll give you another $50 increase. No, no, that's not what I want. I want you to be happy with me. That happiness is far more important than $5,000. You know, when I met this lady in California, her father planted the church in Malaysia. I do not want to trade that with a million dollars. I'm serious. I'm not bragging. I'm not saying money is not important. Just to see her and know about her parents' legacy. Wow! Man, that is amazing. That is amazing. Okay? Yes. So, Matthew 9, 35 to 38. You can write this reference down. Anywhere the PowerPoint will be given you know, to your church. When Jesus saw the crowd... I'm going to end in about 10 minutes or less and, and then I'll give a uh, question and answer, okay? When Jesus saw the crowd, he was moved with compassion. That was Matthew 9, 35. Before he started reaching out to them and, and, and preach to them and cast the demon, he was moved with compassion. He saw real people suffering. And today, in a country where we have a lot of Bible schools, a lot of churches, can we go back to the basic element of relationship and friendship? How we look at people. What do we see when we see people? Do we just see a lot of political problems? Do we just smell sm smelly, you know, curry and smelly, you know, durian, right? And all this kind of, What do we see? Do we see through their heart? That is what Jesus felt. He saw and he was moved by compassion. And then in Luke chapter 19, uh, many of you remember Jesus and Zacchaeus, okay? And Jesus was aware that somebody was watching him when he was, Jesus was walking in town. And you may not realize that because of your faith in Christ, as you walk to the grocery store, people may notice you day in and day out. People may notice you. You may not be a super Billy Graham. You may not be a super evangelist. But because of the faith of Christ in you, people are noticing you. And all you need to do is to say, Holy Spirit, help me to be sensitive. Who touched me? Just like Jesus, and when he was walking, a woman trying to reach out to him. You know, I want to challenge and encourage all of you. People are watching you. And people are envy you about the peace that surpasses understanding that's in you. They are shy to come to you, maybe because of their sinful nature. And what Jesus did, calm down, shorty. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> I'm going to come to your house and eat curry chicken with you tonight. That's the you know, Minnesota translation. So Jesus realized that somebody was watching him. Somebody was looking up to him and said, Wow, man, this Jesus. You know, this group of people from Glory Baptist Church. Wow. People are saying that in their spirit. When we remain in Jesus all the time, we are able to hear this spiritual thing. You don't have to be a supernatural PhD in theology to sense that. All the disciples those days, they never go to a Bible school. I'm serious. Only Pastor Chris went to a Bible school here, I think. Yeah. Yeah. All the believers are people of simple vocation. And the children are very special to Jesus. 
You must have faith like children, like you. So that the kingdom of God is taught from your perspective, simple faith. So I just want to encourage all of us here that people are watching us. We need to in tune with the Holy Spirit so that we know who are desperately wanted for help. So that we know how to minister to them. Okay, what motivates us? I think I've jumped that slide earlier. Okay, shouldn't be money, shouldn't be guilt, shouldn't be a hunger program in another country. Okay. And we need to realize that mission and discipleship, they are linking together. It should be a lifestyle. If it's not a lifestyle, then it becomes a program all the time and then people will get, uh, what is new? They have to come. What is new? Every year is the same. We've got to raise money. We've got to send money to Malaysia. We've got to send money to Vietnam. We've got to send money to Iowa, to Wisconsin. All of that. I, mean, you know? I mean, those are countries too, you know. I mean, in Wisconsin, people wear the cheese you know, on the head, right? Yeah, you know. So, I mean, you know, so we've got to come back to the basic of mission. It's because God loves you. God loves you so much. You know, we need to understand that the love of God has for us first before we understand that God really cares about those people out there. And Jesus is coming back. When Jesus comes back, the door is closed. Judgment day. When Jesus comes back, there will be no more mercy. It's judgment. So that is something that we need to have the urgency in us to really understand that it's our lifestyle to remain in Jesus so that we are filled with compassion. Okay? So, now onwards, our all picture time. Picture, fun, okay, picture tell a thousand story, okay? So, these two Somali uh, husband and wife, my wife and I, we met them near the U of M, um, you know, Rivers uh, uh, area, uh, Riverside area. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, uh-oh. I've been clicking it. Okay. Yeah, it's not oh, it's not sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Confession. <laughs> I, grew up in a, I grew up not using technology. I, I mean, you know, honestly, yeah, excuse. So my wife and I, uh, we know that this uh, neighborhood has a lot of Somali. They even changed the name of the street, you know, near the West Bank campus to Somali Street, Mogadishu Street. I mean, it, really, they changed the name. So we, we intentionally go there, just trying to um, connect with them, not trying to make any effort, trying to eat you know, in the restaurant. They are so kind. They are so kind. You know, we went there many times. We brought students. We brought American friends to so become their friends. And to make the story short, she told us that her mom is uh, dying. Then I asked my wife. You know, I understand a little bit about Muslim you know, uh, culture. So I asked my wife, can you pray for uh, Deka? So Deka allowed my wife to pray for her in the restaurant. And we are not, you know, super Bible professor, okay? What I'm trying to say is you can do it. And it's just a joy. You know, I mean, to win a $1 million, you know, lottery is a joy. You know, I'm not encouraging you to do that, okay? But this is such a joy, you know, to do what Jesus had done. You are bringing hope to them. And uh, each time when I go there, this man will call me, hey, brother, you know, I'm no more white, I'm brother, all right. From the same father, different mothers, you know. Yeah, so you always give me more food. Oh, the lamb, you know, you got to go there. I got to go there with you. And the lamb curry, oh man, is like awesome, man. We've ordered one portion. It's almost like for two people. 13 US dollar is like two portion. And the chai is so good. I mean, and the tea chai. So, you know, we need, need to make a mission trip. To, I'm still a mission trip to Somalia without taking a passport. Two hours. No more immigration check. You don't have to take off your shoes. You go to the airport, you've got to take off your shoes to go to the checkpoint. But you go to this Somalia place, no need to take off your shoe. Just put on the, the love of Jesus. I've organized one trip one of these days. You'll love it. They, they will just be so happy that I brought a lot of customers to them. And, you know, I'm serious. And by the time, you know, we bring a lot of customers, they will see Jesus. They will see vision of Jesus. Okay, this is a very unique story. Uh, last semester, this one Morocco uh, girl came to church, just out of curiosity. And then uh, I get to know her and her aunt. 
And then after that, I approached them. I said, hey, can we have a Morocco uh, lunch and after church? Because Chris, you know that the church that I go to, they always have lunch after church, ethnic lunch, so that people will stay back. So I told the Morocco you know, ladies, hey, can we get a few Morocco friends to cook a Morocco dish for us? We will pay for the grocery. So they make you know, Morocco food and everything. And then I get to know this man. He was there last semester. And then we become friends. He's about my age. And then we'll be keeping in touch a few times. And he told me that he is not a strong Muslim. He doesn't practice very deeply. Okay, so we have a chance to talk about everything, any religion you want. And he believes in any kind of, you know, spirit that, you know, brings, you know, goodness to people, you know. So I get to know him, I got to share uh, the Bible, you know, reading Psalms 23. Because he's from Morocco, he understands French. Morocco has some French influence. So I, I, I pull out my iPad and, uh, you know, show him Psalms 23 in French. He read it, oh, this is good. Oh, some French word I could understand, you know. So it's good, you know. So I say, I know you like poem. This is poem written by King David. It's for you if we, you know, follow the truth, you know. So that kind of things happen. In McDonald's, <laughs> Ninky Town. I always do ministry in McDonald's, Ninky Town. So when I walk to McDonald's, the manager know me. He said, are you going to pay rent today, buying a cup of coffee? Then you can, you know, work here. So he always joked with me, that guy, you know. So I told him that I'm going to pay my rent today, a dollar and fifty cents for coffee. Then I can, you know, work there. Okay. So his name is uh, Idris uh, Jaffa. So, you know, continue to pray for him. This guy is very unique. He owns a few restaurants. I didn't know that he is such a celebrity, you know, chef. And um, to make the story short, I have a chance to pray with him. Okay, he just uh, came out from some family crisis. So he owned a restaurant in New York. He owned a couple of restaurants in the Twin City. Okay? And then I, my kids, you know, I try to introduce my kids, you know, to different kind of ethnic things so that when they grow up, you know, they won't get panicked. Oh, man, so many different kind of people here. Oh, 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 oh. So I get to connect my kids with other culture, okay? And then uh, this is a very unique story. Last month, my American friends who love to reach out to Muslims invited me. Why aren't you going to go to a mosque where the Muslims pray? Because the imam, which is the priest of the mosque, is very friendly. So I said, okay, let's go to the mosque. So all of us go to the mosque in uh, Woodbury. Okay, we went there. And uh, the friend who is a Muslim gave us some guidance, what to do and what not to do, so that you know, we know how to say it. And, you know. So as they pray, the Friday prayer, we pray in our heart, pray in our spirit, Lord Jesus, please come, please come. If you don't come here, we'll be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Please show up, Lord Jesus, show up. So a lot of Muslims are very happy. They thought we are praying, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, we are praying. So we pray in our own, you know, to Jesus. And we are praying, we are interceding there. So we get to meet the, 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 the priest, the imam. And I have a conversation with him. I went to his office the next two weeks. He, the sermon is in English. Because a lot of Muslims are from different countries, from Somalia, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, you know. So the sermon is in English. Okay, so I met these two gentlemen there. The middle guy is from uh, Pakistan, and the guy with the beard, he's from Burma, but he's a Muslim. Guess what they, 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 they asked for help for? They said, Why, Han? We know that you, you like to work with young people and youth. We want to set up an after school program for Muslims. Can you help us? <laughs> what do you say? After school program for Muslims? You want a Christian's help? Wow, he knows I'm a Christian. I'm not faking. But because the fact that I'm from Malaysia, that opens a lot of doors. Because Malaysia is a Muslim country. Okay? So, they are counting on me to come up with a mission statement for the after-school program for Muslim. My goodness. God, you're just like sending Joseph to Egypt and then you send him out. I found out I feel the same way. You know? I'm not a great missionary or a great pastor, God can use all of you here. Okay, so I'll be meeting with them next week to come up with a mission statement for after school program for Muslim. Okay? And uh, if they need volunteers, I know who to look for. <laughs> That's a place in North Minnesota they can know how to cook curry. I will tell them that. <laughs> oh, this is really something awesome. Okay, I'm not telling this because I'm good. I'm telling it because God is good and it's going to make you gooder. Is that such an English gooder? No. But yeah. So, how many of you remember who is uh, Carl Lewis? Carl Lewis. 
in the 80s. He's a famous Olympic athlete. He won four consecutive Olympics in the long jump. Okay, and uh, when I was, you know, in college, I always like, wow, Carl Lewis is like the king of track and field, you know. Those days, you know, track and field is great. And uh, to make the story short, I was also in track when I was in college. Okay, and then uh, my Malaysian friend, um, another Muslim friend in Malaysia, uh, whom I competed against, he told the Malaysian government that Waihon is in the States. And he had uh, competed in the States and he understood about the US uh, sports, you know, kind of a culture. And the Malaysian government wanted to send their athletes overseas for training. So they, they know that US has a very good place, you know, for training short term. So I linked them up with Santa Monica Track Club, and this guy is the guru of the track coach around the world. His name is Joe Douglas. If you were to Google his name, Joe Douglas, he's like the god of track and field, you know, right, something like that. So I met up with him. Such a hump. He's 80 years old. He's still coaching. And one of his students, 86 years old, one of his students, 86, so they compete in the age group, you know, they have age category. So he gave me a tour of his house and everything, such a humble guy. And uh, he told me, yeah, your Malaysian athlete could come here. And it's a non-profit organization, but we do take honorarium. So the Malaysian government appointed me to arrange this program. And I become like a guardian to the Muslim athletes to come here. Isn't it strange? I told the Malaysian government, I'm not going to take a dime from them. Because Malaysia country last two years has a lot of uh, corruptions uh, involved, uh, 700 million US dollars, you know, bad news all over the world. So I wanted to earn their trust. I wanted them to ask me questions eventually and earn the trust to share my faith with the Malaysian Muslim Sports Authority. Why I'm doing what I'm doing for them. So God will set up opportunity. For us and these are my two uh, disciples body when i mean disciple is we have like a a time very intention that we meet to study the word to meditate to share lives and then my definition of discipleship is we must multiply we must look for other young men in the next couple of years to pass our life on that's what second timothy 2 2 say paul told timothy that the things that you have heard from me Pass it on to faithful men and women. Pass it on. Yeah, it's not everybody would accept that concept, but we can look for Timothy in this area. And sometimes the Timothy may not be in this town. Sometimes they are maybe a phone call away. And as you pass your life, your spiritual experience to them, your, your love for Jesus to them, your love for the Word of God to them, these young believers will continue to catch it. You know? I mean, Pastor Chris cannot disciple, you know, I mean, uh, 100 people here. Jesus only can do 12. That's what he gave us the example. If we were to disciple one or two, man to man, woman to woman, for a time of maybe one year, and then reproduce, reproduce, the effect is greater than Billy Graham. It is proven. And then volunteer in my high school. When I go back to my country, I'll go back to my high school and volunteer as a Muslim, uh, dominated, you know, country. So when I volunteer, I earn the right to share. And I get the church involved, you know, in the area. Please pray for this teacher. Please pray for this student and so on and so on, okay? So, yeah, this is how a Muslim teacher you know, in Malaysia, you know, they dress, you know, like a hijab. Okay, I was conducting a teacher's workshop there. This is how the classroom in Malaysia looks like. Okay, I was conducting a teacher's workshop in Malaysia, and uh, this is my Muslim relatives. Okay, the guy wearing number 35 is me. Yeah, okay. Okay, this summer when I go back, I will see them. And this is my group. We call ourselves disciple makers because we are very intentional. Uh, one girl on my, on my uh, right, she's from Cameroon, and then the next guy is from Nepal. And then the guy in the middle is from Congo, but he lives in America. The far in the middle is from Malaysia. Husband and wife, American, and then Korean. So we have an intention, very intentional, to reproduce what we have learned. And many of them are not pastors. They are either professors or teachers or businessmen, but they have a heart of discipleship in their, in, in their DNA. So start with prayer, my last slide, and end with prayer. Okay, that's what Matthew, uh, sorry, Acts chapter 1, you know, verse 4 to 9 says that. 
you wait first before you go. Be very intentional. Because if you are not intentional, you have a lot of random plans that come into your life. So everything I do right now in my life is very intentional. It's very intentional. Okay, if I want to see that person, I make sure that person is there at 4 o'clock. If not, I will check on him. 3.30, if he's not there, I'm not going to show up too because if he's not there. So I'm using my time and my money very intentional right now. Okay, be flexible because we need program, but be prepared all the time. Come out from our comfort zone. Let's go to Somalia without going overseas. It's only two hours away. The food is good. And I'll be your tour guide. I'm serious, okay? And those people are very happy when, when I bring business to them. And, um, you know, they love elderly people. Those culture, they, they respect elderly people, okay? And be willing to invest time, money. Most of the time when I, when I met, you know, my Muslim friends or non-Christian friends, I got to buy them coffee, you know? I mean, I got to you know, buy them some lunch once in a while. Yeah, it's not that, you know, I have to be stingy all the time. Or I got to buy them lunch, you know, just to connect with them. And then partner with a local missionary. I'm very humble to say that about 60, 70 years ago, how many years ago, you know, missionary from U.S. came to plant a church in Malaysia. Here am I being reversed back. So that's my presentation. You have any questions? I know I'll go over time. Okay, you have any questions? Anything? Any questions? Yeah. Oh, this is what the Muslims wear in Malaysia when they pray, maybe in other countries too. Okay. And I have a lot of resources here. And those resources are good. Uh, maybe the church can order from you know, Amazon uh, for a library. Okay. Do not underestimate this uh, size of a church. You can do a lot of things. Today, with internet, with connections, you know, with missionaries in the Twin City, you can reach the world without going overseas. You can literally reach the world. Just having a map of the world as you lay hands and pray for Uganda, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Every Friday, I encourage you to pray during lunchtime from 12 to 2. That is the time where the Muslim think that it's the most sacred time for them. As you pray, God listens to your heart and God will really want to reveal to them, to the Muslim, that Jesus is the Son of God. It's not just a prophet. Friday, please join me in prayer for the Muslim in Minnesota. A lot. I'm not talking about United States. I'm talking Minnesota there. You know, at least hundred thousands. Anything else? Questions? Any questions? No. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah.